Okay, this is the presentation of a solution to problem number 34 from your chapter nine homework. Let's do this the way the solutions manual intended. We'll use the work kinetic energy equation to solve this problem. And then we can go back and use kinematics and corroborate some of our results. We've got a couple people here in the conference with me. Uh, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions as I'm going through this solution here. Turn this sideways, we've got a ramp. There's a block on the ramp with mass M, which is given. Of course, we're given the in inclination and we're told that uh, somebody's tied a string or a rope to the, the side of the, the box here and they're dragging it up the ramp. So let's say the point of attachment is right here. And the rope that's, that's being used to drag the block is not parallel to the ramp, it's actually inclined. And I'm, I'm going to exaggerate that angle just to make it easier to visualize. I'll put a dotted line parallel to the ramp. So this angle theta, let's see here, given, We know that this block has, a, or this crate has a mass of eight kilograms. Uh, this angle theta here, the ramp is inclined by 30 degrees. And then I'll, I'll use the letter phi for this additional angle. We're told that that's 18 degrees. And the tension here, whoever's pulling on this rope is, is pulling on it with a force of 120 newtons. Uh, rough calculation, divide that by four, that's something like 30 pounds, a little less than 30 pounds. And we also have to deal with friction. So as this thing is being dragged up the ramp, and let me go ahead and draw uh, this arrow indicating a displacement. I'll call this uh, delta x, which means the coordinate system I'm using looks like this. The x-axis will be the, the axis parallel to the ramp's surface. And uh, let's see here, five meters is that displacement. Positive five meters up the ramp. And lastly, we have to worry about friction. So I'll just put a mu sub k here. And I noticed from exam two, a lot of people are, are thinking of this symbol as being a force. Uh, this is a dimensionless number. This is the coefficient of friction. You have to multiply this by normal force to get an actual friction force. So we're told that the kinetic friction, since this crate is sliding, is one quarter. Okay, and in part A, the first thing they're asking us is, what is the work done by the various forces on this crate? So I suppose first we should identify those forces. The, the tension's already been drawn. Don't forget about gravity. The, the ever-present gravity, Fg. Since the crate is sliding up the ramp, Kinetic friction will always point opposite the velocity. It would be very mysterious if friction gave you a little boost in the way that you're already moving. So of course, friction is gonna point opposite the displacement. I'll call that F sub K. And I've purposely drawn it shorter than what would be the X component of the tension because if this thing's moving up the ramp, presumably the net force would be up the ramp. It's, it's possible that the net force along the ramp is zero, in which case the crate would be moving at constant speed, not accelerating, but we wouldn't actually know that until we wrote Newton's second law. However, for this problem, we don't actually have to write Newton's second law, F equals MA. We're in chapter nine now, where we're dealing with the integrated form of F equals MA. Don't forget that W equals delta K, this is, Newton's second law after you've integrated. Work is what you get after you integrate force over distance. Changing kinetic energy is what you get after you do a definite integral of ma over distance. You wind up, uh, or you wind up with one half mv squared final minus initial. Okay, any other forces here? Don't forget that the, the ramp has an interaction with the block with two components. The component parallel, you know, this is the parallel component of the ramp pushing on the block, and we call that component friction. But don't forget that the ramp also pushes in this direction on the block. And since that's normal to the ramp, we call it the normal force. 
This is not a free body diagram. It's kind of in between a sketch and a free body diagram. If I really wanted to do the free body diagram, I would draw a little dot over here, put all the forces coming out of the dot, and not worry about the complication of uh, a sketch here. But I think we'll skip that step. Um, they would like to know the work done by each of these forces. So we've got one, two, three, four forces. That means we'll have to calculate four so-called works. And in order to do that, I'll remind you that if you're dealing with a constant force, in general, uh, work is a line integral. We have to integrate the dot product of force with infinitesimal displacement. You'd have to evaluate this integrand at each little point along the motion. That, that's the general defini definition of work, but we almost never have to use you know, the full mathematics of the line integral. Uh, if your force is constant, then much like in first semester calculus, you can bring that constant out front, and then you would be integrating dr. So in other words, you do the integral first, then you do the dot product. In here, you're doing the dot product and then integrating that. And the integral of dr, that just means add up all your little scoots, dr plus dr plus dr plus dr. That's going to give you the total displacement. So we, all we have to do is dot force with total displacement. This is, this is often the, the go-to formula for calculating work. You can only use it if the force is constant. But a lot of the forces that we deal with in these homework problems are constant forces. Case in point, this problem. The friction depends on the normal force. Well, the normal force isn't going to change. The tension is constant and gravity is constant. So let's just apply this dot product to all four forces. Does anybody have a question before I calculate those four works? No. Okay. We'll start with the work done, but you know, let's get the easy one out of the way. Work done by the normal force. This one's my favorite because it doesn't require any calculation. The normal force points that way, but the displacement is up the ramp. What's the relation between those two vectors? Displacement, which is delta R, and normal force, they're perpendicular. And you should just memorize that when you dot two perpendicular vectors, you get zero. The work done by the normal force would be normal force dotted with displacements. See, I'm, I'm applying this formula to specifically the normal force. And I just set that equal to zero. And I'll say since normal force is perpendicular to delta r, the dot product of two orthogonal vectors is zero. And that's, that makes sense, right? Because if the block is moving up the ramp, a force that's pushing perpendicular, it's not going to speed the block up, and it's not going to slow the block down. In other words, it's not doing any work on it. Um, so let's move on to, let's do the work done by tension. Work done by tension. That would be the tension vector. Notice I'm not just writing T, I'm writing T with the arrow sign. Tension vector dotted with displacement. Okay, now we have to decide which method we will use for calculating the dot product. In a previous video, I, I presented the, the two methods. You can either take their Cartesian components multiply and add, or you can multiply the magnitudes of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between them. In this problem, that's the easier way to go, I think, because we're given the magnitude of the tension vector, we're told it's 120. We're also given the magnitude of the displacement vector, it's five meters, and we're given the angle between them. So the two vectors we're looking at are the tension vector and the displacement vector. So I'm gonna write this as magnitude of tension magnitude of delta r times the cosine of the angle between them, and I've called that angle c. Okay, well, I'm, I'm calling it delta r because the most general type of displacement would be a displacement in x and y and z, but this delta r here, it, it's really the same as delta x. It's the five meters. So we take 120 newtons times five meters times the cosine of 18 degrees. And let's think for a moment, what, what sort of number do you get when you take the cosine of 18? 18 is in quadrant one. Cosine is positive in the first quadrant. So we expect a positive number to come out here. 
Does it make sense that the tension is doing positive work? Well, what does this tension tend to do? If the, if the block is moving up the ramp and you're pulling in this direction, wouldn't that tend to speed the block up rather than slow it down? So if, if your force would have a tendency to speed something up, you're talking about positive work. So let me plug those numbers in and check the units, by the way, a Newton meter, that's what we call a joule. That is the unit of work slash energy. Work and energy, same units. 120 times five times the cosine of 18. Why does my calculator do that? It just gives me a zero. <clears throat> okay, 0.95. That doesn't sound right, does it? 120 times five, that should be bigger. 120 times five times the cosine of 18. There we go, 570.6. I'm going to keep a lot of digits, and you'll see why later. I, I don't want to introduce too much rounding error. Okay. So this, this is less than, just for comparison, in a previous video, I pointed out that 4,000 joules, 4 kilojoules, is the same as a nutritional calorie. So we're talking about considerably less than 4,000 joules, or much less than one nutritional calorie. That makes sense, because we didn't pull this thing very far, and we're not pulling that hard. It shouldn't be that much energy. I mean, 30 pounds? If you lift something that weighs 30 pounds through a distance of five meters, I don't think you burned even one calorie. And so it's no surprise that this number comes out less than one calorie. Any questions about the calculation of, of that particular work? No. Okay. What else can we do here? The work done by friction. This one requires the most calculation. Okay, that's going to be the friction force dotted with the displacement. Well, first let's decide what's the angle between these two vectors. Displacement points up the ramp, friction points down the ramp. The angle between those two is 180. That makes sense because when we go to take the cosine, the cosine of 180 is negative one. That's going to give us a negative quantity for the work. That's what we expect because if something's moving that way, and you're pulling backwards on it, you're going to slow it down. That is negative work. Or, or you know, if you were the only force acting on it, you would cause it to slow down. In reality, there's several forces here, so it may actually be speeding up. Okay, um, here's a, an easy mistake to make. This came up last semester, I remember. Whoop. Runaway page. This statement is, is true. We, this is the model that we use for kinetic friction. But this statement is not true. If I make this a vector statement, it's no good. Does anybody see why this is not true? It, the magnitudes do have this relation, but friction points backwards down the ramp and the normal force points perpendicular. How can two vectors be proportional if they point in different directions? That's not possible. Um, you, can't have, you can't say that this vector is proportional to this vector. They'd have to point in the same direction if one is just a scalar times the other. So, not true. Um, so don't, don't fall into that trap right here. But what I can do now is say, well, that's going to be the magnitude of the friction. See how if you don't write the arrow symbol, you're just talking about magnitude times the magnitude of displacement. And this time I'll go ahead and emphasize that's, that's uh, delta x times the cosine of the angle between them. Well, let's decide what that angle is. I, oh, I already did that, didn't I? That's the cosine of 180. Okay, well, we're not done yet because we still have to evaluate friction. We do know that the magnitude of friction is mu times the normal force. And I'll put times negative one. I could have just written a minus sign out here. Okay, so I, I ran out of room here. I, I can't finish calculating this work on this page because we still have more to do. We need to determine, this is supposed to be an N right here. We have to evaluate the normal force before we can calculate the work done by friction. So you may be thinking, well, that's easy. It's just mg. Or maybe it's just mg cos theta. But both of those are incorrect for this problem. I've said this before, but the only way to know for sure what the normal force is would be 
to write Newton's second law along the normal axis. You need to write an equation that has n in it so that you can solve for n. So let's go over here now and say uh, to determine n. And you know what? I thought I was going to get out of doing a free body diagram, but that's not the case here. So this dotted line will represent uh, the surface of the ramp. We have gravity. Normal force. Friction points backwards. And don't forget the tension. Okay, uh, I'll use a marker here to mark the components of tension. The tension vector has a component parallel to the ramp and a component perpendicular. So if I call this T, this would be T sub X and T sub Y. It's this T sub Y that's going to add a, an extra ingredient to the normal force. So uh, the, uh, the block may be accelerating up the ramp. It might be getting faster and faster. We wouldn't know unless we plugged in, or unless we wrote Newton's second law for the X equation. But I think it's safe to assume that there should not be any acceleration this way. The block is not in circular motion and it's not you know, lifting off the ramp or falling into the ramp. So the Y acceleration should be zero. For that reason, I can set the sum of the Y forces to zero. Okay, I see an N in the positive Y direction. I see the Y component of T. And how do we get that? Look at this right triangle. If you take the hypotenuse and multiply by the sine of phi, you'll get the opposite component. So plus T sine phi. And you've seen this many times. Remember, we can resolve the, uh, the gravity vector as well. And you should remember that this angle is also theta. Theta is not the same as phi. Uh, we need this component of gravity, the adjacent side in the gravity triangle, so to speak. So that would be minus mg cos theta. Those three components must sum to zero. And that tells us that the normal force would be mg cos theta, that's a familiar expression, minus T sine phi. And that has a nice physical interpretation because uh, usually, I almost said normally, but that would be confusing. Usually the normal force only has to support the component of gravity, which is normal to the ramp. But in this case, we get a little extra help from this component of the tension. It's like whoever's pulling on the rope, they're, it's almost like they're reducing the weight of the block by this much. So the ramp does not have to push up with the full mg cos theta. It gets a little help from the rope. So this is one of the more difficult parts of the problem, recognizing that the normal force is a little more complicated. But now that we've got the normal force, we can evaluate the friction force. So F sub K would be mu times N. Let's go ahead and evaluate that. So we've got a coefficient of 0.25 times, I don't think there's really anything I could factor out here. Okay, a mass of eight kilograms times 9.8, times the cosine of, remember theta was 30 degrees, minus the tension of 120 newtons times the sine of 18. I'm gonna take a moment and check that number. I don't wanna use the book's value because they may have rounded. Minus 120 times 18 sine, I get equals, multiply that by 0.25. I find that the friction force is only 7.70, Three, I'll keep a few digits there, Newtons. And if you're doing this along with me, please let me know if you've got a different answer. Unless you're watching this video after the fact, because then it would be pointless for you to email me and say, I got the wrong number because the video is already done. <clears throat> now we can go back here and evaluate the work done by the friction. Okay. The work done by friction would be the uh, magnitude of the friction force, which I just found to be 7.703 newtons times the displacement of 
five meters. There's our Newton meters, joules, times negative one. So what is 7.703 times five? Three point five one five joules with the minus sign. Don't forget that minus sign. Okay, and that number sounds familiar to me, having done this problem before. Let's compare the size or the magnitude of those two works. The tension did quite a bit more work in joules than did the friction. So you wouldn't expect the friction to slow this block down by a whole lot. Any questions so far? Because there's still quite a bit to do in this problem. No, I'm good. Okay. What other works do we have to calculate? There are four forces. We've already calculated one, two, three different works. The last one would be the work done by gravity. Work done by gravity. And now, even though this is really a topic for the next chapter, chapter 10, I would like to briefly mention the connection between work done by gravity and gravitational potential energy, because many of you have already encountered potential energy in another class. You know that since this block is going uphill, it's going to gain potential energy. In fact, you may even know the formula MGH. If you lift something through a height H, you've given it an additional potential energy, MGH. Well, uh, we're going to see that the, uh, the change in potential energy here is actually the opposite of the work done by gravity. You can see that, um, oh, if anything, gravity is kind of pulling back on the mass as it moves up the rapids. It would tend to slow that mass down. So it's doing negative work, and yet the mass is gaining potential energy. So whatever the work done by gravity is, we can just put a minus sign in front of it, and that would be the change in potential energy. That's really a topic for the next chapter, but these two chapters are very interrelated. Okay, that's going to be the gravity force, notice vector symbol dotted with displacement, okay? And uh, that would be magnitude of gravity times magnitude of the displacement times the angle between them. Well, magnitude of gravity is easy. Magnitude of the displacement, that's the uh, delta x there, absolute value. And then let's figure out the, uh, the angle between them. Now, like I said, you, you could find the Cartesian components of these vectors and do the dot product with the other method, but I find this a little easier. So let's take a look at the diagram here. Uh, let me draw an extra, an extra line. Is this helpful? Let me think here. Uh, what we need is the angle between the displacement vector, which is up the ramp, and the gravity vector. Yeah, so I find this line a little helpful because does everybody see that this angle would also have to be 30 degrees? This is the same as theta. This angle right here is the angle of inclination of the ramp. So uh, what we really need is the angle between this vector. Let me lay that out. Displacement up the ramp and gravity. We need that angle. And that would be this angle plus 90 degrees. That's pretty easy. 90 degrees plus 30 degrees, that's 120. We're taking the cosine of 120 degrees. What do you get? What type of number do you get when you take the cosine of an angle in quadrant two? This is between 90 and 180. You'll get a negative number. That's what we expect. We expect the gravity to be, or the work done by gravity to be a negative number. Let me plug those numbers in. Eight kilograms times 9.8, uh, that'll give us newtons times five meters, there's the joules, times the cosine of 120. So gravity does negative 196 joules of work. Still a smaller number in magnitude than the work done by tension. So it looks to me, it looks like to me, if you add up all the works, work done by normal force, tension, friction, and gravity, you're going to get a net positive number. This number, minus 196, minus uh, 38, that still comes out positive. If, if a net positive work is done, remember this W really means the total work. 
the work done by all forces because we got it by integrating F equals MA, where F is the net force, the sum of all forces. Since the total work comes out positive, that tells us that the change in kinetic energy is positive. In other words, this block is speeding up. That's another way of saying that, uh, that the block is accelerating up the ramp. So if we applied F equals MA along the X axis, we would expect to reach the same conclusion. There is an acceleration up the ramp. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and the problem's not asking for this, but I want to calculate the total work here. So let me take that 570.6 joules done by tension minus the 196 from gravity minus the 38.515 done by friction. And I find that a total work of 336.085. Again, I, I just want to avoid rounding error here. Okay, because what I'm going to do is go back later and use kinematics to find the speed at the end and look at the change in kinetic energy and conf confirm that it is this number. That is it for part A. They just wanted us to calculate the work done by each force. Part B requires a concept that I have not presented in a video yet. What's the increase in thermal energy of the crate? Delta E thermal. Okay. Well, let me give a brief discussion here because I didn't do this in a video. Just consider two situations here. First, imagine a person pushing a crate over a garage floor and let's say this is frictionless. That's kind of a silly scenario because that never happens. Okay, you've got, sure, you've got a normal force on the crate, gravity down on the crate, but the only force in this direction would be the applied force from this person. So this person is definitely doing work on the crate because the crate moves to the right and the person is pulling, or pushing, excuse me, to the right. So where does this person's work show up? I mean, you, you can feel it when you push on something, you're expending energy. Where does all that energy go? Well, some of it is dissipated as heat within your body and it's radiated from your body as heat. You, know, you, you sweat and that evaporates. That's a topic for 3C, which we're talking about right now. But if this floor really was frictionless, then after you finish pushing on the block, it's gonna be moving. It will be sliding across the floor and still moving because it's frictionless. Again. That, that doesn't happen in real life. So maybe you should think of a hockey puck or a bowling ball, but you can see where your work shows up. It shows up as the kinetic energy in the box. Consider now um, in a different scenario where there is friction. Non-zero friction. And let's suppose that, uh, that this person is pushing just hard enough to oppose friction. So let's say you're pushing with 20 pounds and the friction from the floor is also 20 pounds backwards. So you're, you're walking as you push this crate across the floor at constant speed. Constant speed means no increase in kinetic energy. So what's going on here? Um, how could the kinetic energy not be increasing if work is being done? And I think I actually will uh, wait for somebody. There are three people here in the conference. Maybe somebody can help me out here. I just said that um, if the forces balance, the acceleration is zero. That means the speed does not change. That means there's no change in kinetic energy. How can you have zero on the right side of this equation if there is clearly work being done on this box? Does anybody want to help me out? What's, how do you resolve this contradiction here? If the crate is not accelerating, there's no change in kinetic energy. That means the, the right side is zero. How can the left side be zero if this person is doing work and the friction is also doing work? Is it because that's friction? Wait, wait, what'd you say about the friction? The friction is uh, doing work? That's true. The, the friction is doing negative work. I guess I'm yeah. getting half the answer here. The friction is doing negative work because it points opposite the motion Here's the, the displacement. Yeah. 
friction's doing negative work, the person's doing positive work, and yet the kinetic energy is not changing. So this is zero. How is it possible for the total work to be zero? If they cancel out? There you go. Person's doing positive work, friction's doing negative work, those numbers can sum to zero. So each individual force may be doing non-zero work, but when you look at the total work done, it may be zero, in which case the object is not speeding up and it's not slowing down. So where does that work go? The work done by the person, this is, this is the whole point of this little mini discussion here. Over here, it's easy to see where your work shows up. All your hard labor shows up as kinetic energy. It's just like if you throw a rock, you're doing work on the rock, where does that work go? You can see it after the rock leaves your hand. The, the rock is moving, it's got energy, and that energy is gonna end up somewhere else. You know, maybe you knock a can off of a log with it, or I don't know, you're hunting and you kill a poor little bird. The energy is used to do something, but over here, where's that energy showing up? Because it's not showing up as increased energy of the crate. That you're not seeing your labor appear as increased kinetic energy. So can anybody figure out where the energy is going? And I'll give you a hint. Heat. Rub your, when you rub your hands together, where does all that work go? Heat. When you, when you rub your hands together. It's like heat. Yeah, that's the whole point usually of rubbing your hands together because you're trying to warm them up in the cold. So the, the, the friction, that work done by friction shows up as what, what your book calls dissipated thermal energy. We say that the energy is dissipated, uh, or the other, yeah, we consider friction to be a dissipative force. So very briefly, I'll just say in this class, dissipative, dissipative forces, there are only two that I can think of. Kinetic friction is a dissipative force and drag. Those forces take uh, the energy of, for instance, a moving crate, and they dissipate that energy as what's called thermal energy. And I won't go into detail now because I'd have to draw some pictures. Your book's got a nice discussion. If you could zoom in, make it to the, to the scale of like individual molecules and atoms. When you rub your hands together, you don't see your hands moving, but if you could take a, 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 a microscope, excuse me, if you could take a, like an electron microscope and look at the particles of your hand close up, you'd see that they're all jiggling a little bit faster now that the temperature has been raised. So it's kind of like microscopic kinetic energy. All the particles that make up the tissue in your, your skin, they would be jiggling just a little bit faster after rubbing your hands together. So that, that kinetic energy showed up somewhere, but it's now on a microscopic or sub-microscopic level. You can't see it as the, the macroscopic motion of, of the box. It shows up submicroscopically. I'm saying submicroscopic because you can't actually see atoms under a normal visible light microscope. Well, okay, that's, that's a lot of information there, but the, the equation that we need, the equation that comes out of this discussion is the following. Delta E TH, this TH is for a thermal, thermal uh, connotes heat. So delta E thermal uh, suggests a change in thermal energy and it's always a decrease, excuse me, increase, I got that backwards. It's always an increase. Um, can you imagine rubbing your hands together and feeling them getting colder? Like that's, that's probably never happened to you. Why would, why would friction remove heat from something? That, that just doesn't happen in our experience. So it's always an increase, at least in this chapter. And here's how you calculate it. Numerically, it's the same as the work done by dissipative forces. It sounds funny, but W dis. That would be the work done by either kinetic friction or air drag. There's one thing we have to add to this equation though. If you look at the diagram for this problem, and you're probably realizing now that this is a lengthy solution to this problem. Um, if, if the block moves up the ramp, but friction points down, friction would be doing negative work. But isn't, isn't the thermal energy between the crate and the ramp going to increase? Yeah, so let's pause for a moment. Um, you know, where does that thermal energy show up? When you rub your hands together, 
which hand gets warmer? Of course, it's both hands. By the same token, the crate, the, you know, the bottom surface of the crate is going to get a little warmer, and the surface of the ramp will get a little warmer. So the, the, uh, the energy gets dissipated, I would say, in the crate, the ramp, and even the surrounding air. It's a lot like in, your, in a car when you apply the brakes. The brake pads are sliding over the, uh, the brake discs, and that energy gets dissipated as increased temperature of the pads, the disc, and also the surrounding air and you know, nearby parts in the vehicle. Okay, so this is an essential equation. Where did it go? W dis, yeah. You must know this equation, but there's one thing I left out. The work done by dissipative forces is always negative because those forces are always opposite the displacement, and yet the change in thermal energy is positive. Things always warm up because of friction. So we really need a minus sign here. This is uh, an essential equation from this chapter. You were very likely to have a problem on exam three where you need this relationship in order to find dissipated thermal energy. Does anybody have a question about that before we use that in this problem? No. Okay, so that's what they're asking in part B. What is the dissipated thermal energy? All we have to do is find the work done by any dissipative forces. I only see one dissipative force, that would be the work done by friction. So I'll say delta E thermal, that would be the negative of the work done by the dissipative forces within the problem. There's only one, that would be the work done by friction. We already did that, great. So let's go back and, oh, which page was that on? Here it is. We already found the work done by friction, negative 38. So I'll take the negative of that. I'll just round that. We'll say 38 joules of uh, thermal energy were dissipated. And that's kind of small compared to the work that was put in. Whoever's pulling on this rope, they did 571, let's say, joules of work. Of that 571 joules, 38 are dissipated as thermal energy. That sounds about right. You wouldn't expect to, to uh, drag a crate across a surface and have the surface get super high, just over five meters of, of sliding. That would be a little surprising. Okay, there was a lot going on in that problem. I, I'd like to look at one other thing about this problem, unless somebody, again, unless somebody has a question here. Hello, Esteban. Hey, hey. sorry, join, join late, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, there's no penalty for showing up late to uh, video conferences. That's the nice thing about this remote, remote instruction. That's probably the only nice thing about remote instruction. Okay, what I'd like to do is, is go back and use kinematics this time to try to confirm this number. Because I want you to internalize that what you're doing here really is applying F equals MA in integrated form. W equals delta K comes from integrating F equals MA. So if we go back and use F equals MA directly, we should get the same result. Um, so let, let's try the, uh, using kinematics here to figure out how fast this block is going after it has been pulled through five meters. Now, if you read the problem carefully, they don't actually tell you how fast the crate was going at the beginning, which made me wonder, uh, does that mean I cannot apply? kinematics, um, like how are we supposed to proceed if we don't know what the velocity was initially? But it turns out you can just make an assumption about it and you still get consistent results. So I'm going to assume that the initial velocity is zero. And then we can use kinematics to find the velocity at the end. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just do this quickly since we're past, we're over it. Chapters uh, four through eight, you should already know that stuff. The acceleration would be the net force over the mass, net force in the x direction. So I go back to my sketch or my free body diagram. I've got a component of tension up the ramp. I've got friction down the ramp. And I've got a component of gravity down the ramp as well. So you can, you can take a look at the free body diagram and confirm that. But I'm just going to write all those. Uh, I've got a t cos phi up the ramp. I've got an mg 
sine theta down the ramp. And don't forget about friction. I've got a mu k n down the ramp, and I'd have to divide all of that by m. Okay, 120 newtons was the tension cosine of 18. At 8 kilograms times 9.8 .8 times the sine of 30. I remember that the sine of 30 is 1 half. Minus 0.25 times ugh, the normal force. Did we actually get a number for that? I think we did, yes, yeah, 7.703. Here is why I kept all those digits, because I want to see if the result that I get matches what we found in uh, part, part A. Okay, that's the net force in the x direction. I would have to divide that by the eight kilograms. Let me evaluate all of this. Okay, 120 times the cosine of 18 minus eight times 9.8 .8 times the sine of 30 minus 0.25 times 7.703. I have to hit equals first so that my calculator does order of operations correctly. Now I can divide by eight. And I find the acceleration is a little surprising because that's more than one G. That means that this person is, is pulling on the block pretty hard compared to the object's weight. This is a good fact to remember. If something is accelerating at a rate greater than G, that means the net force on the object would have to be greater than the object's weight. Let's think about that. Eight kilograms times roughly 10 newtons per kilogram. That's 80 newtons, but this person's pulling with 120. Granted, it's, it's not in the x direction, but so this convinces me that it is possible for this thing to be accelerating at a rate greater than one G. Okay, that's most of the work. Now that we know the acceleration, I'm thinking back to my kinematics. I would like to find the velocity at the end. I've got a displacement of five meters. I've got two velocities and I have an acceleration. Which equation relates those for constant acceleration kinematics? That would be V1 squared minus, oops, V1 squared, that's a two, minus V initial squared equals two times the acceleration times the displacement. This is the equation that will get me the quantity that I want. So let me cross out that because it's just zero. I'm assuming it's zero. And I find that the velocity at the end of the displacement, after it's been, oops, after it's been dragged through five meters, two times the acceleration of 9.125 times the five meters, I hit equals. Don't forget to take the square root. I find that this block is going 9.552 meters per second. And let me just check that real quick times 9.125 times 5. Okay, now that I know the velocity at the end, I can find the change in kinetic energy. It could be the very last step. So as a check, delta K, that would be the kinetic energy at the end of the displacement minus the kinetic energy initial. If it wasn't moving initially, it had no kinetic energy. So 1 half mv squared, that's 1 half times 8 kilograms times the velocity I just found, 9.552 meters per second squared. And I'm hoping, I know this is kind of cluttered here, I'm hoping that the number I get here is that number. Eight divided by two times, 9.552. The suspense is killing me. Here I go. 364. 0.96 joules. What? Those are not the same. Professor, I have a couple, um, well, one thing actually. Uh huh. Um, when you got the number for the normal force, okay. I think uh, you actually got the number for the static, or sorry, kinetic friction, not the normal force number. Oh, I, I stuck the 0.25 in there? Yes. Good catch. All right, let's fix that. Aha. Okay, now did I did I use this for N? Let's see if I calculated the friction correctly. I did. Okay, so, so the only place where I incorrectly used this number would have been in... Acceleration. 
perfect. Okay, let's fix that. So um, I see it. this is already, this whole thing would be 7.703. So I don't need this 0.25. Perfect. This is already mu times the normal force. So let me go back and that makes sense because this is this acceleration seemed suspiciously high, just a little bit on the high side. Okay, I'm glad somebody was here to catch that. 120 times cosine of 18 minus 8 times 9.8. I know that the sine of 30 is one half minus 7.703. Okay, and I have to divide that by 8. All right, this makes a little more sense. 8.403, I'll call it. Okay, that's the actual acceleration, which would bring our final speed down a little bit. So if I take that and I multiply by five meters times two, then I take the square root. Uh, the velocity at the end of the displacement is slightly lower, 9.167, we'll call it. So I am rounding. I don't expect these numbers to come out exactly the same. 9.167, and I'll just use the space up here now. I'll say check. Uh, delta K would be kinetic energy at the end minus kinetic energy initially. One half mv squared. So I've got this velocity squared times one half m. Well, one half of eight is four. So times four. There we go. 336.1 joules. And the discrepancy between the two is merely due to rounding error. So that's pretty satisfying. And again, you may be thinking, whoa, that's amazing. You could use F equals MA, or you could use W equals delta K, and you get the same answer. It's like a mystery. Unfortunately, it's not a, a magic mystery. W equals delta K is F equals MA. So if the fundamental theorem of calculus works, then of course this should work as well. It's kind of, it's kind of nice. I mean, it took me years of doing these, even though this is you know somewhat... Uh, introductory physics here. I had to do this stuff for years before realizing that a problem like this really is a check on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's pretty satisfying. That's the most involved problem from your homework. Does anybody have any last questions about that problem? Okay, I'm going to pause. Nope. Right Let's take a look now at number 35 from the same chapter. This is a problem about little Johnny sliding down a playground slide. Oh, I'm sorry, his name is Justin. It'd be funnier if his name was Johnny, little Johnny, but we'll go with Justin. Okay, playground slide. This And this problem always reminds me of one of the earliest most sobering lessons I learned in life. I remember being a kid at a playground and going down one of these slides and thinking, you know, this slide smells like urine, but that can't be that smell. Nobody would ever pee in a slide. And then I got older and realized, yes, somebody would definitely do that. And that's probably what it was. <clears throat> okay. This, uh, this slide we're told is eight meters tall. And here's little Johnny. He's about to go down the slide. Now, Johnny's mass, MJ, he's a little kid, so we don't expect this number to be very large, 30 kilograms, all right? And we're told that when it gets to the bottom, so here's Johnny sliding, off, sliding at the, or flying off the end of the slide there at 11 meters per second. So they, they pick really silly numbers because that is like 25 miles an hour. I don't think you want your kid flying off at 25 miles an hour, unless this was a water slide or raging waters. But this is funny to me. <laughs> um, I mean, how fast are you actually going at the bottom of the slide? One mile per hour, probably less than that. And we're supposed to figure out how much thermal energy was dissipated on the way down. Well, in, ch in chapter 10, this problem will be really easy because we'll have potential energy at our disposal. We'll, in fact, let's just do it right now because it's so easy to do even in your head. Um, if you use MGH 
is the formula for potential energy. I'll, I'll introduce this more next chapter. How much potential energy does little Johnny start out with? 30 kilograms, basically times 10 times eight. Well, 10 times eight is 80, 80 times 30, eight times three is 24 with two zeros. So we're working with, I'll do this off to the side, the initial energy is something like 2,400 joules. Let me check that here. 30 joules times, 30 kilograms times 10 times, yeah, 2,400. Okay. Well, we can easily calculate how much energy shows up as kinetic energy at the bottom using one half mv squared. So one half times 30 is 15, 15 times 11 squared, that's 121 times 15. So at the bottom here, Johnny's only got 18, 15 joules. Uh, what the dilio, to use the parlance of our times, where did those extra joules go? We started out with 2,400 and there's only 18, 15 left at the bottom of the slide. Well, you guys know from experience, when you go down the slide, if you're going fast enough, and this kid is going pretty darn fast, the seat of your pants gets hot, really hot, in fact. Like, huh, this is a, you know, just a word of caution. If you're ever at Disneyland in the Mickey and Friends parking structure, it might be tempting to go to the very top floor and sit on the escalator, the side of the escalator where you put your hands and slide all the way down to the bottom. What is that, like six stories? It might be tempting. I don't recommend it. I'm just saying, because you're gonna get an awful lot of thermal energy dissipated on the way down. So from an energy perspective, uh, this is so intuitive, you could just say that the thermal energy dissipated would just be whatever you started with, um, which is the gravitational energy at the top, I'll call that UG1, minus the kinetic energy at the bottom. Take that 2400 joules, subtract the 1815, and whatever the difference is, that's the energy that got dissipated thermally. So we can answer the problem that way, no problem. But I'm gonna go back and do it using the work kinetic energy equation, because that's what we're supposed to be doing in this chapter. So it looks like 585 joules of energy were dissipated. Any questions about that approach? All right, um, the other way we could do it would be to say, say or <clears throat> work or delta E thermal, that's just the negative of the work done by any dissipative forces. Remember, dissipative forces always do negative work, negative, negative would give us a positive change in thermal energy, that's what we expect. Things should heat up. The only dissipative force here would be the kinetic friction between the seat of Johnny's pants and the slide. So that would be the negative of the work done by kinetic friction. Well, that would be kinetic friction dotted with displacement. And then we run into a problem because delta R, presumably, that would be the, the displacement down the slide. But remember, uh, you can only use this type of calculation if what is true. Is it A applicable with an A? Yeah. If the force is constant. A. You can only just dot force with displacement if your force is constant. That's the only way to, uh, to do the calculation of work. I don't actually know if the kinetic friction force is constant. Because think about it, if this is a curved slide, uh, then when the kid is right here, the normal force points that way, here it points that way, the normal force would always be changing. And that means that the kinetic friction force would always be changing in magnitude. So I don't think the kinetic friction is constant. It's not a constant vector on the way down. It's probably changing in magnitude, and it's certainly changing in direction because the tangent line, slope of the tangent line changes. So I cannot actually use this equation. Uh, furthermore, uh, even if I was gonna say, you know, work done by friction would be the line integral of friction dotted with displacement. We're not mathematically equipped in this class to evaluate this for this arbitrary curve. We're not even told what the curve is. 
So we're gonna have to back up here and, and figure another way of doing this. Hmm. Hopefully you're appreciating the difficulties here. Um, I'm looking at my notes. Does anybody, is anybody confused by my thought process there? Or do you have a question about, you know, these steps that I just described? This was super easy. This is how your solutions manual does it, but we're trying to do it using the methods of chapter nine. Here's what we can do instead. We do know this is true. This has to be true. Where W is the total work. We know this is true because it comes from F equals MA. So the extent, to the extent that F equals MA is the proper description of mechanics, this equation is also correct. I only see uh, two forces doing work here. WG plus W dissipative. And uh, you might be thinking, wait a minute, though there are more than two forces on little Johnny. Let's think about it. Um, I'll draw the forces on him. It's, let's just say, since I already drew him here, you've got gravity pulling down on him while he moves. You've got friction, which is backwards and, you know, anti-parallel to the tangent. And then there's also the normal force. So arguably, we would have to calculate the work done by one, two, three force. Work done by gravity, work done by friction, and work done by normal force. However, can anybody tell me why we don't need to worry about the normal force? This showed up earlier today. Why is the work done by the normal force zero? Isn't it because it's um, perpendicular to the um, friction, kinetic friction? You're, you're almost correct. It's perpendicular to the displacement. So at all points along Johnny's uh, motion down the slide, dr is that infinitesimal little displacement. His displacement is always tangent to the surface. He's always moving tangent to the surface. And that means dr is always perpendicular to the normal force. So when you do the dot product, here I've, I've written it for uh, kinetic friction, but over here I can say work done by normal force would, would be the integral of n dotted with dr. This integrand is always zero, and that means the work done is zero. That's something worth memorizing. For something moving along, something that's constrained to move along a surface, the work done by the normal force is always uh, zero. Okay, and this will get us to uh, the answer that we want. I guess I'll start here again. Um, is it going to require much effort to calculate the work done by gravity? What, what can you say about the gravitational force? Does it depend on position or time? And I, I think I'll wait for somebody to answer this time. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, I'm thinking about how to calculate the work. And if, if the gravity force is constant, we could use that simpler formula. So. Does the gravity force depend on position or time for little Johnny? No, we always think of gravity as having magnitude mg and it points straight down. So I can say since, since uh, fg is a constant vector, the work done by gravity, I can, I can use this formula. All I have to do is dot the gravity vector with the displacement. And here I'm going to use the other method for calculating work. So it's good that we're doing this problem. We have an excuse to use this other method of calculating the dot product. Well, that would be um, the x component of gravity times the x component of displacement, and that's what we call delta x, plus the y component of gravity times the y component of displacement. I'm using the other method for calculating dot products. Multiply the x components of these two vectors together, multiply the y components together, and then add. And so if, if you're confused by that, go back to uh, the discussion in your book about the dot product or a previous video. Instead of doing magnitude times magnitude times cosine of the angle between them, this time I'm using Cartesian components because that's actually easier. Um, what is the x component of gravity? 
if I'm using the typical coordinate system, what is the component of gravity horizontally? That would be zero. So that first term is just gone. So all I really have to do is multiply the y component of gravity by the vertical displacement. And in this problem, that's easy. Uh, you know, the y component of gravity is just negative mg. If you think of gravity as a vector, its y component is negative mg. And then what's the y component of the displacement? Well, the overall displacement, let me mark up this diagram even further, is the vector that goes from starting to ending position. This vector is the overall delta r, the displacement vector. They start here, Johnny starts here, and he ends here. We're interested in the y component. Wouldn't that just be the negative eight meters? That was easy for this problem. So I'll, I'll call that uh, negative h. He, he descends through a height of eight meters, and of course, that's in the downward direction. So um, I'm choosing to write it this way so you can see the connection between the work done by gravity and potential energy because some of you know that formula, MGH. Okay, let me plug that number in. That's Johnny's 30 kilograms times 9.8 times the height of eight meters. Gravity did, I'll call it 2.352 kilojoules of work. All right, so let me go back to this equation here. Work done by gravity plus work done by dissipative forces equals uh, delta K, that would be K2 minus K1. This is kinetic energy at the bottom of the slide. This is the kinetic energy at the top. And, and I'm sorry, I just realized I've, I've chosen different subscripts before I went with uh, zero for the subscript at the top and one for the subscript at the bottom. So I guess you have to be flexible here. Okay. We're told that uh, it's kind of implicit. They don't actually say that Johnny starts from rest at the top. We just have to assume that he's not moving at the top. And since I've already calculated this now, I can solve for W dissipative. So I'm getting, I'm getting W dissipative indirectly. K2 minus work done by gravity. And you could just plug in numbers now, but I'm gonna do this, negative, uh, Wg minus K2. I'm going to factor out a negative one because conceptually this makes sense. Um, gravity did 2.352 kilojoules of work, but only something like, didn't we already calculate the uh, kinetic energy at the bottom? Yeah, 1815. So 2.352 kilojoules minus uh, 1.815 kilojoules. This is how much work gravity did, but not all of that work shows up as kinetic energy. Only this much energy shows up as kinetic energy, or only this much of the work. So the rest of it is what was dissipated by friction. And of course, the minus sign is there to remind us that uh, dissipated forces do negative work. Okay, so this is negative 2.352 minus 1.815. And that's negative 0 0.537 kilojoules. You could have just written it as 537 joules. And I think I'll do that now. The whole point here was um, to find the increase in thermal energy. Well, delta E thermal, that's just the negative of the work done by dissipative forces. So I'm finding 537, oops. joules. So it's really a very simple problem. If you're able to start from uh, potential energy, the concept of potential energy, but that's really for the next chapter. This number 585 is a little different from the 537. And the reason for that is when I, when I estimated this number, I used uh, 10 for, nine, for G. Instead of 9.8, I used 10 because I just wanted to do a quick calculation in my head. Okay, so let me just let me just summarize the, the overall thought process here. Um, the one way to answer this question, what is the thermal energy dissipated? If we could somehow calculate the work done by friction directly, we would just take the negative of that. Because remember, 
whatever work is being done by friction is showing up as dissipated thermal energy. The problem with doing it that way is we'd have to know exactly how the friction depends on Johnny's position along the slide, and we would have to be able to know how to do this line integral. And we don't have enough information, and we're not mathematically equipped to do it that way. So we had to do it indirectly. We just go back to F equals MA in integrated form. Um, if we could find the change in kinetic energy, we would know what the total work is. And fortunately, the total work only depends on two terms, and we can find this one. So since we're able to calculate the gravitational work, and we know what the total work is, being equal to a delta K, we can solve indirectly for the work done by dissipative forces. So to, to hear all of this at once, it might be a little overwhelming. I said a lot just now, but if you go back and rewatch this, um, We'll leave out the discussion of this line, in, line integral here. There's really just two ways uh, you could approach this using the material in this presented in this book. You could use the work kinetic energy theorem, which would be appropriate for chapter nine, or next chapter, you could use potential energy. And this really is the, the better way to do it conceptually. Okay, any comments about this problem? Okay, I'm going to stop recording here.